And we're back with another Pico CTF challenge. This time, Wireshark, do 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 do. A forensics challenge. Can you find the flag? And then we're presented with a PCAP or a packet capture. So I'm gonna download that, I'm gonna drag it over the desktop. And since I'm in Kali, Kali Linux, I already have Wireshark installed. I have a video that will walk you through how to install on Windows if you need to. So we will open up Wireshark and We'll talk a little bit first about what a packet capture is. A packet capture is a way of capturing traffic that goes across your network so that you can inspect it later and figure out either that malicious activity is happening on your network or debug problems and performance issues. Um, any, any kind of visualization can happen. And the way to think of this is as a series of envelopes. So if you have a letter you wanna send to your grandmother or a bill or something like that, you can't just put the bill in the mail. You need to actually encapsulate it with an envelope that tells who it's from, who it's going to, pays postage, etc. And the reason is the internet, it, it may seem easy and simple when everything works, but it's actually a, a fairly involved process where you have to figure out the way to route traffic. And so you may be over here and you have to go through a switch, a branch, another branch, another switch, before you finally end up where you wanna be. So what we're gonna have is a series of different envelopes. And I know this is a little bit involved, so just bear with me, don't look at it all at once. On the left side, we have our sending computer and it's sending a message. So think that letter to grandmother at the very top, that's your application. And that's the data that you actually care about. And then as you move down through these different layers, some of these correspond to just logical concepts and some of them actually correspond to, to physical concepts. So these first really three are, are essentially the same, but once you get to transport, then things start to, to get a little uh, different. So you'll add on, an envelope and this just it describes how to move this data and then you'll move on to the network and you'll see there's a packet header that we're now adding on to this and the packet header uh, is ip generally and then you've got another uh, a data link segment which is uh, ethernet and you can see we've added on two more elements to to wrap this and when i say wrap uh, you'll notice yes this this layer does actually physically enclose it but it doesn't have to uh, you can see here we just we prepend to the beginning of the data for the segment header, for the packet header. It just needs to be something, some additional data that then later we can strip out. So now we have this big unit that surrounds all of our data and describes it. And then we finally get to the physical layer where things actually go across the wire in zeros and ones. So let's just take a step back. We've got our sending computer. We go through this process of encapsulation until we get to actually doing the sending. We send the bits across and then it's received, this is a receiving computer on the far right at the physical layer here as a series of bytes. And then it transforms those bytes into recognizable headers for it and it starts stripping off layers. So you can think of this as someone opening these different envelopes that you have and then taking the next step. So maybe you, you rip it open and you find, this isn't actually supposed to go to your grandmother in the house, but it's supposed to go to your grandfather. You just know your grandmother is very good at picking up the mail. As, as a poor example. So it goes to the next layer, and the next layer sees there's a packet header and that tells it how to process it. And then it forwards it up to the software that handles the transport layer, which again, sees what it can use. It uses a segment header to decide where the data should go. And then the data is finally available. And this crazy crisscross that you're seeing here, this is just trying to convey that the application layer is trying to send data to the application layer. The presentation layer is trying to send data to the presentation layer. The transports talk to each other. So on the left side, the transport encapsulates with information that the right side will need to de-encapsulate and ultimately get it across. Anyway, that's more than enough uh, theory on this. So what we have is we have Wireshark. And since this is our first time using Wireshark together, I'm gonna just do a quick breakdown of it. It's a great tool, definitely worth the investment of time to learn. You have three different um, I don't know, panes, I suppose. Come on. That one really does not want. There we go. Need to grab it. So each packet is one of those envelopes that we were looking at earlier that's going across the wire. And we've received it on this side. And remember how we talked about things being wrapped. So at the very bottom, we're seeing the raw bytes that moved across. And then we're seeing different encapsulation layers that are being highlighted. And we have different visualizations of that. So here we have, we have a frame, which is the entire thing. We have ethernet, which when we drill down to tells us it has a destination and a source. So this is a, a Mac 
for sending and receiving. And then if we drill down further into our encapsulation, we can see we have the IP protocol here, which is doing more routing. And uh, we, we won't get into all this, but I want you to just see as I click on these individual elements, what this is doing is this is giving me a nice visualization of things because looking through the bytes, uh, it's pretty painful. But if you just happen to, uh, to click up here, you get a human readable way of looking at this. And then when you look down here, you can see exactly where in the bytes it appears. And uh, I should just say on the far left here of this bytes presentation, that is the actual hex bytes. And then on the right is the ASCII interpretation of those bytes, which is sometimes meaningful. In this case, we see the, the body of uh, an HTTP request, so post. In other places though, it, it doesn't have any meaning. And so it just comes across as gibberish. All right. So now our goal is to find the flag. So as we look at this, again, it can be overwhelming, but you have uh, nice ways to go through all the data. And one of the nice things that I like to do when I, I start off is you can see we have 987 packets, which is not even a large packet capture. Normally you'll, you'll see thousands, tens of thousands because networks are chatty naturally. And I, I don't even think this has been going that long. I think if we look at the times, let's go to the very bottom. This is 23 seconds of network capture on a not very active network. So you can certainly imagine it being much bigger. So let's try to get a sense of what's actually going on by going under statistics and conversations. And we can see the different conversations that we have going on. And you can look at, there are different conversations that are happening at different levels of that encapsulation process that I was talking about with the different protocols. So at the ethernet, we can see we only have four. IP is a little more meaningful. We can see that this 134 address is talking to this 104 address. We can see how many bytes are actually going across each direction. So we can see the total is about uh, 1.4 kilobytes, but we can also see that it tends to be going in one direction only. Or I'm sorry, I, I misread it for a second. So there are five packets that went from A to B, which was about 600 bytes. And then there are seven packets that returned from B to A for about 800 bytes. So it's actually fairly even in both directions, but you could definitely find other ones which are going to be more off balance. So 103 to 104, what you can see here is, while they had about the same number of packets that moved from one to the other, the size of those packets was dramatically different. So A sent 301 kilobytes to B, whereas B sent uh, about, what's that, 1.1 meg back. All right, so this is one thing that we can do quickly. So there aren't many conversations, so that's nice. We can also look at the statistics and we can look at the protocol hierarchy and this will give us a sense of which protocols are seeing the most use. So at the top level, again, remember, everything is kind of riding on these lower levels of encapsulation, the, the common protocols. So no surprise, Ethernet is 100% of the packets. They involve Ethernet. Almost all of them involve uh, IP, with the exception of some ARP traffic. ARP is just address resolution. And as we keep drilling down, what we can see is most of the bytes are occurring in HTTP, about 91 percent of the bytes. So that seems like a good place to me to look for uh, the flag potentially. And there are ways that we can search. So if we wanted to drill down on conversations, we have this display filter up top and I could search on different things. So for example, I could search on IP is equal to 192.168.38.103. And then when I press enter, what you're going to see is the number of packets will decrease because we're filtering. Uh, did I? We didn't find any, which makes me think I put that in wrong. 192.168.38.103. Maybe it needs to be IP adder. There we go. I think, I think that worked. Uh, yeah, so right now we have displayed only 864, as you can see down here. Let's try one more just to show you that, yes, this is in fact working. Okay, so 104 is probably us because most of the traffic is now displayed. And just because this is so much fun, I'd like to find one more. Sure, 1.1.1, .1 .1, just to show you, yes, we have no traffic with 1.1.1. .1 .1. 
So there's nothing that's appearing. So one of the ways that we could try to find this is we know that the, the rough format of a flag is something like Pico CTF and then the curlies. So we could try searching for that, but that's not finding anything for us. We could also, we could try manually walking through each of these and looking, but that seems incredibly painful. So since we know that most of the traffic is occurring in the HTTP level, what I think would be a good uh, use of our time would be to filter on those HTTP conversations. So I will apply as a filter the selected conversation, and I'm interested in both directions of traffic. And then when we go back, what you can see is we did an IP adder for A and B. So we're only going to look at this conversation. And now we don't have much that's displayed. And again, we could go through this. So just to, to quickly walk you through what's happening here, we have 104 is reaching out to 134 on the TCP protocol. And it's saying, Sin, I want to synchronize with you. 134, which is our server, the guy who we just sent a request to, responds to us. And he says, I acknowledge you. Let's synchronize. And then finally, 104 says right back to the server, OK, I acknowledge you. Let's start. And it sends an HTTP request, because that's what we were trying to establish, is a connection so that we could do an HTTP request. And then we can see it's doing a get. And it's doing a get for slash, so the root of the server. All right, so this is a way that we could read through it, but it's pretty slow and painful. I think you'll agree. So instead, we're going to follow the HTTP stream. And what we can see in different colors is we can see the client making a request, the get that we talked about for slash. And then we can see the server making a response. And the response looks garbled, but I can see that rough structure that we were talking about with the, the Pico, CTF, the curly, and then some inner content. So my first thought was, if I know some clear text, I know that this should probably be Pico CTF, then I can start to figure out exactly how they transform this. And to do so, first I'm going to bring this over into Visual Studio Code. I want to just grab that little string. And then I looked at my expectation, which was I thought it would look basically like this. And so we can see the C is changing into a P. And then if we look here, we can see that the uppercase P is turning into a C. So these seem to be um, offset by some amount. So we're, we're either plusing or minusing some amount along the alphabet to get to our transformation. And we can see here, actually, this is even better. So here's lowercase c going to p. Here is lowercase p going to c. So it seems to be symmetrical. And if we look at a, an ASCII table, we can look at the number representations of the different letters. And so the C here is decimal 99, and the P is decimal 112, a difference of 13. That led me to believe this is probably rot 13, or rotate 13. And we can see it is. And we have our flag which we will go and we will submit to make sure that it's correct. Perfect. Hopefully that helped you. If it did, please like, subscribe, etc. It helps me out a ton. Thanks. Bye.